What's happening, everybody? It's Sean with Reactions to the Classics. And today, we got a fun one. We got a top 10 list of Bob Dylan's Hidden Gems, brought to us by our patron and longtime friend of the channel, Osmond. Thank you so much, Osmond. Really appreciate it. Really looking forward to diving into this. We got a ton of Dylan up on the channel. So Hidden Gems ought to be real, real nice addition to that. Before we get started, you guys know the drill. Hit the thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button if you'd like to support us. Our, check out our Patreon link below. Check out our social media stuff and also our Twitch link for our live streams. All that said, let's just get into this list. Osmond just said he, he considered these hidden gems from Dylan's lesser known and generally not that highly acclaimed album. So he's mining the gold, right, from the otherwise... Uh, not so great stuff out there. So let's just get right into this with number 10, When the Night Comes Falling from the Sky from the album Empire Burlesque in 1985. Osmond says, I think this is one of the lyrically best songs of his career. Big statement there in certainly the 80s. But the reason it is 10th place is that I think the production is awful. The song is still really strong though. In the outtake version on the bootleg series one through three with parts of the E Street Band in the backing band is fantastic. Many Dylan fans dislike this song, but mainly because of the slick 80s production and nearly disco-like sound. Underneath all the 80s sound, this is still a really solid song. I think the lyrics are really strong, and I find them to be a bit ominous. And I found when members of the press, as well as Dylan's own fans, dubbed this album as Disco Dylan, it was mainly for this song, as Osmond talked about. It was originally an upbeat, pile-driving rocker recorded with the E Street Band guys, Roy Baton and Stevie Van Zandt. Unsatisfied with recording, Dylan radically recast the song as a contemporary dance track. Well, from what Osmond said, that probably wasn't the best choice, but long one here, seven and a half minutes. As always, I'll have the lyrics up. won't really say much during the song. Also, just a, a tidbit here in case this is your first time joining us. We do not have the music up. Uh, you won't be able to hear it because of copyright. But if you check out the link below, the whole reaction's up if you want to follow along with me. If you just want to know what I think of these songs, just hang out here. Once again, thank you, Osmond. When the Night Comes Falling from the Sky. First off, shout out to the great Al Cooper on rhythm guitar. Also, I thought the drumming by Sly Dunbar was excellent. Interesting backing vocals by Madeline Quebec. She's coming in there with Bob all the time. Now, kudos to the musicians. I didn't care for the arrangement whatsoever as it seems like no one else did either. It's hard to get through that 80s production. We've done some albums of, of Bob during this time, reviewed some of them, and most of them I didn't care for a whole lot. I love Dylan, we recently on the channel did our top 50 albums to do a top 100 albums of RTTC, and three of my top eight albums of all time are Dylan albums. So it's not that I don't love Bob, because I love Bob. The lyricism, I do agree, is, is really, really good. You know, it's a seven and a half minute song, so you know with Bob, you're not gonna get repetition, man. You're gonna get true, true lyricism, 10 verses. What I see out of this song on first listen, and I haven't broke down the lyrics, so it's, it's hard with Bob sometimes on first listen because his lyrics are so intricate at times and, and more complex, you know, there's more than meets the eye, but it starts out, look out across the field, see me returning, smoke is in your eye, you draw a smile from the fireplace where my letters to you are burning. You've had time to think about it for a while, so she's obviously upset, she, he's been gone, she's burning the letters. Uh, well, I've walked 200 miles now. Look me over. It's the end of the chase and the moon is high. It won't matter who loves you. You'll love me or I'll love you when the night comes falling from the sky. So they're obviously going to hook up. They've had issues. As the song unfolds, she's upset with him. Seems like maybe she wasn't totally faithful. Kind of hard to tell, but I, I think that might be true. All the way down to verse 6, he says, I, wherever he was. I don't know if he's talking about where he was and returning from or just his life experience, but I saw thousands who could have overcome the darkness for the love of a lousy buck. I've watched them die. I see that could be a reference uh, to the Bible. It could be a reference to on the waterfront. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter which one it's a reference to. It's just great advice, right? I've seen that in my lifetime too. I've lived 49 years on this earth. I've seen people chase that mighty buck and lose himself and anything they cared about in that. He says, stick around, baby. We're not through. Don't look for me. I'll see you. Uh, in your teardrops, I can see my own reflection. It was on the northern border of Texas where I crossed the line. So what line did you cross? I don't want to be a fool starving for affection, so he's lonely. I don't want to drown in someone else's wine. So I don't know if they've been drinking, something happened or something almost happened. 
Um, but you know, a really good, uh, really good lyricism. I don't know what I think of the song because the production's hard to get over. I don't know that I hear disco as much as I just hear mid '80s, right? The synths and just kind of the way even the drumming breaks down in parts. I think he does a great job drumming, but just the way it's arranged there. But I mean, it's '80s, man. 1985. I was 14 years old. It is in the heart of my teen music loving years. I mean, I didn't know this song, but it has that sound. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's hard to go back and judge artists for trying to sound of the times, right? Because that was of the times. You're trying to stay relevant. So can't fault that. Next up at number nine is a song I'm very familiar with. However, I've never heard Bob's version of it. Mr. Bojangles from Dylan in 1973. Osmond says, the song is written by Jerry Jeff Walker and was a hit with Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. That's the one I know. The album Dylan consists of rejected songs from the self-portrait and new morning sessions. And I looked at did a little research. This, this particular track is from the new morning sessions. It was released without Dylan's consent. This is my favorite song from this album, which also includes covers of Elvis and Joni Mitchell. I think I'm gonna have to go check out the Dylan doing Elvis. All right, number nine, Mr. Bojangles. Mr. Bojangles, wow. Uh, that's some of the best vocals and strongest vocals I've heard from Dylan, especially those last 30 seconds when he's holding that dance for three different times. Wow. Great songwriting. I know Bob didn't write it, but this song fits Bob perfectly. Like Bob could have wrote it because it's just fantastic songwriting for Bob to cover you, who I think unquestionably is the greatest songwriter of all time. You can argue with me. I don't even think it's even close. For him to cover your song had to be, be quite the honor. But Jerry Jeff Walker wrote this in 1968, but he said it came as an inspiration from an encounter with a character in a New Orleans jail. Uh, Jerry was in there for public intoxication in 1965, and he said he met a homeless man who called himself Mr. Bojangles. Walker said they talked for quite a while, then at one point someone asked the man if he'd do one of his dances, and, and that's what this song is all about. I knew a man, Bojangles, and he danced for you in worn out shoes, so he talks about all that. Met him in a cell in New Orleans, and just talks about the cell and how we danced in there and how he was dressed and how he danced at county fairs throughout the south. He, he spoke about 15 years, or he spoke with tears of 15 years of how his dog and him just traveled about. But his dog up and died, he up and died. After 20 years, he still grieves Mr. Bojangles, Mr. Bojangles dance. I can understand that. I'm a dog guy, lost two dogs, you know, over the last five years and man alive. Yes, there you go, Bob. I'm glad you're bringing that forth and, and Jerry Jeff for writing that part. So it, it just finishes, he, he d said, I dance now at every chance at Honky Tonks for drinks and tips, but most of the time I spend behind these county bars because I drinks a bit. So he's going in, he's trying to perform, he's getting a tip, but I guess he's probably spending it at the bar and he ends up behind these bars. Nice little wordplay by Jerry Jeff there. Fantastic song. And now we're up to number eight from that same Empire Burlesque album in 1985 that our first track, When the Night Comes Falling from the Sky, is from. This is tight connection to my heart. Osmond says, the opener of Empire Burlesque, originally recorded for Infidels, which is now that we do have a review up on the channel, is Someone's Got a Hold of My Heart. Mark Knopfler's on it. A good song, but the production could be better. As the rest of Empire Burlesque, this song is a typical 80s production, which is not every Dylan fan's cup of tea, but the lyrics and the melody is very enjoyable. My research tells me it's a single, went to top 40 in New Zealand and Belgium. Dylan used a basic track, as, as Osmond said, from one of the Someone's Got a Hold of My Heart takes from 1983 and added vocal overdubs in January of 85 including vocals by female backup singers. We got Mick Taylor on the guitar. As elsewhere on this album, it includes references to a number of lines of dialogue from Humphrey Bogart films and possibly some other non-bogey films of that time. The new Rolling Stone album guide includes the composition and quote, the all-time canon of great Dylan songs on lousy Dylan albums. When I researched that and found it, I just thought that's exactly what Osmond's trying to do. So there we go. Let's check out number eight. Tight connection to my heart in parentheses. Has anybody seen my love? Tight connection to my heart, parentheses. Has anyone seen my love? First off, shout out to Mick Taylor on the guitar and Ted Perlman. Excellent job on that. Backing vocals by Peggy Blue, Queen Esther Morrow, and Carolyn Dennis. And they come in on this song a lot, and I noticed the backing, as I pointed out, in the other song from this album. It's, it's kind of strange to hear Bob in that aspect. It's also 
different in a lot of Dylan songs that I know in the fact that it has a well-developed chorus that keeps revisiting. You don't see that a lot of times in Bob's songs. Uh, basically, it does have all these, and, and I was clicking on what some of the lyrics were from, all these different references to movies and, and bogey movies. So uh, to just even have the talent to be able to write that way is, is unbelievable. I can't imagine how long that takes, but first lines are great. Well, I had to move fast and I couldn't with you around my neck. I said I'd send for you and I did. What did you expect? Uh, my hands are sweating and we haven't even started yet. I'll go along with the charade until I can think my way out. I know it was all a big joke, whatever it was about. Someday maybe I'll remember to forget. So another great line in there. Uh, he's, he's feeling the storm come on. He's getting his coat. He tells her to stay in, so to, to be warm. Has anybody seen my love? That, that's that chorus comes in. I don't know. Has anybody seen my love? And then verse four has all these allusions to these bogey movies. Uh, you want to talk to me, go ahead and talk. Whatever you got to say to me won't come as any shock. I must be guilty of something you just whispered into my ear. And then verse five, you're the one I've been looking for. You're the one that's got the key, but I can't figure out whether I'm too good for you or you're too good for me. Another great lines. I guess the key to his heart. Verse seven, tons of allusions to uh, to bogey movies. So I did enjoy that one. I thought the female backing vocals, is this weird to hear on Bob's voice? This kind of arranging I'm not sure is the, is the best, this kind of style, for, for the beauty of Bob's voice and, and where that sounds the best. But like I said before on, on the first track on here, you know, it, you can't blame a guy for trying to stay relevant to the time. So tight connection to my heart at number eight. Let's move on to number seven. We've got In the Garden from Saved in 1980. Second album in his Christian trilogy. We have done two of the albums in his Christian trilogy, but we have not done this one. Osmond says a nice song about how the people reacted to Jesus from his most gospel sounding album, Saved. It gives examples of how people meeting Jesus didn't fully understand the scope of what he came to do. I really like the instrumentation and Dylan's nice vocal delivery. All right, look forward to this one. In the Garden at number seven. Wow, I really enjoyed that one. I am a Christian, so I understood everything he was referencing to. A lot of interesting things on here. I mentioned it during the reaction, in case you weren't watching along. In the middle of it, pretty long instrumental run in there, which you don't get very often, and over a minute outro instrumental run, which you also don't get with Bob very often. Nice songwriting technique. He repeats a line twice, like in the first verse, when they came for him in the garden, did they know? He repeats that twice. Then he puts something else in the middle that's two lines always. In this case, did they know he was the son of God? Did they know that he was the Lord? Did they hear when he told Peter, put up your sword after they came to take him in the garden? Peter slices off an ear and he tells Peter, put it up. When they came for him in the garden, did they know? When he came for him in the garden, did they know? So he does that in every single verse. He comes up with two lines that are repeating, two separate lines that tells a story, and then repeats those first two lines again to end out the verse. So in the second one, when he spoke to them in the city, did they hear? Nicodemus came at night so he wouldn't be seen, saying, Master, tell me why a man must be born again. When he spoke to them in the city, did they hear? So he's referencing John 3, the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, is the conversation with Nicodemus that Dylan is talking about here, uh, him coming at night. Why would you come at night? Well, see, he wouldn't be seen. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He couldn't be seen talking to Jesus. Verse 3, when he healed the blind and crippled, did they see? When he said, pick up your bed and walk, why must you criticize? Same thing my father do, I can do likewise. So telling him that Jesus is the son of, uh, of God and maybe that uh, Bob can, can help people out too, not performing miracles, but maybe he's alluding to he can help people as well. Verse four, did they speak out against him? Did they dare? Uh, the multitude wanted to make him king, put a crown upon his head. Why did he slip away to a quiet, quiet place instead? Because they kept wanting to crown Jesus, make him the earthly king. That's the way they understood the Old Testament. He was going to come back, be the earthly king, restore Israel to world domination. That was not what Jesus came back for, obviously, if you know your Bible. He didn't come back to do that, so he kept slipping away to a quiet place on his own. In verse 5, when he rose from the dead, did they believe? He said, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Did they know right then and there what the power was worth? Wow, very powerful song. Loved it. I think being a Christian, obviously, I understood all the lines. And great songwriting techniques. Gospel-like choir in there with an organ in there. So very well done. 
Well, we're almost halfway through this list already. We got Copper Kettle at number six from the Cell Portrait album in 1970. Osmond says it was written by Albert Frank Badeau. This song about moonshine was made popular by Joan Baez, and I think this is one of the most enjoyable songs on the strange Cell Portrait album, consisting of both cover songs, original songs, and live tracks from the Isle of Wight Festival. I like the nice country vibe of this song. I found where critic Clinton Highland wrote, Copper Kettle strikes all the right chords, being one of the most affecting performances in Dylan's entire official canon. That is some high praise. All right, let's check it out. Copper Kettle, I gotta say, one of the best vocal performances I've ever heard from Dylan. He sounded fantastic in it. It's just what it sounds like. A copper kettle was used to make moonshine, and he just goes through the song and talks about how he made it, but he sings it in a way almost like a, a love song to the alcohol, just in the in the tone of his voice, um, and just how they go about making the making the moonshine, making the whiskey. My daddy, he made whiskey. My granddaddy, he did too. So it's a family business. We ain't paid no whiskey tax since 1792. So in 1791, uh, then President George Washington put in a whiskey tax to help pay off war debt. It's highly controversial. People started trading whiskey for goods instead of actually selling it to avoid the tax and all this stuff that you know is irrelevant here. But eventually Thomas Jefferson, when he becomes president, repeals his tax. But that was a nice little throw in there. But I don't have a lot else to say about it. Just a fantastic vocal performance. That is definitely the star on that one for me. Now we're up to number five, Born in Time from Under the Red Sky in 1990. Osmond says, the follow-up to Oh Mercy, Under the Red Sky is a strange album with many of the songs resembling nursery rhymes. This song is a really strong song with a pleasant melody and beautiful lyrics. I found it's a reworking of the original material recorded uh, at the previous year's Oh Mercy sessions, as Osmond said. Eric Clapton covered the song for his 1998 studio album, Pilgrim, and actually released it as a single, so maybe you'll know it from that. Maybe I'll know it from that. Born in Time. Born in Time. Looking at the musicians on this, I'm assuming this is right, but quite a uh, conglomeration of talents here. First of all, background vocals by David Crosby. Piano, you got the great Bruce Hornsby, which uh, with his band Bruce Hornsby in the range had a lot of hits in the 80s or a few hits at least the way it is being the most popular then you've got Randy Jackson on bass Randy Jackson of American Idol fame and you got Kenny Aronoff on drums played with Mellencamp and several other people over the years but also was on an access TV show the top 10 that the Trey and I and McKenzie watch all the time so what a what a grouping of people uh, musicians are on this thing and the meaning of this one, I'm trying to kind of discern a little bit. Verse 1, in the lonely night and the blinking stardust of a pale blue light, you're coming through to me in black and white when we were made of dreams. So he's reflecting back on this relationship he had with this woman. Verse 3, not one more night, not one more kiss, not this time, baby, no more of this. Takes too much skill, takes too much will. It's revealing. You just came, you came, you saw, just like the law. You married young, just like your mom. You tried and tried. You made me slide. You left me reeling with this feeling and he just gets back to when we were when we were born in time eight verses on this nice songwriting as usual nice little tune nice instrumentation uh, pretty good choice to put in here at number five now we're up to number four uh, appropriately enough billy four from pat garrett and billy the kid in 1973 osmond says dylan went to mexico and had a role in the western movie pat garrett and billy the kid which was shot in durango Chris Christopherson starred as Billy the Kid in the movie. Apart from his minor role as Alias, one of the people in Billy's gang, he recorded the soundtrack for the album. It consists mostly of instrumentals, but have a few tracks with lyrics. The most famous song from the film is Knocking on Heaven's Door, which I was very familiar with with the Guns N' Roses cover of that years later. But that is certainly not a hidden gem, Osmond says. The other song with lyrics, though, is Billy, which was recorded in many versions, which is why we got Billy 4 here. This version's Billy 4 and includes the longest set of lyrics out of the version. The song outlines the story of Billy the Kid, and it's got a real Western flavor to it. I wasn't even aware of this movie, so looking forward to this one. Billy 4, number 4. There you have it, Billy 4, off the Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid album. Billy 1 is on this album and Billy 7, but not the other ones. It's an interesting one of Dylan's little quirks. He doesn't care, right? Uh, instrumentation, nice little harmonica 
solo there in the middle. But interesting acoustic guitars. It's doing acoustic guitars. One was keeping a steady rhythm in, in my left ear and the right one was jumping around. So that was a nice little touch here. And just tells the story of Billy the Kid. Mentions Pat Garrett who ends up killing Billy the Kid in, in a Fort Sumner, New Mexico or around there, which I used to live about an hour and a half from there. But a lot of people don't know Billy the Kid. He was called the Kid. He's only 21 years old uh, when he was shot and killed. So just a great little story that uh, perfect for Bob to play out. Just talking about everything in, in little New Mexico illusions where I lived for a long time. Businessman from Taos, uh, El Paso, which of course is in Texas. I'll be in Santa Fe about one Billy you've been running for so long and dropping in a little Tula Rosa, which is in Southern New Mexico. So all over the place. Nice tune. Maybe I'll have to check out this movie at some point. And now we're up to number three. Death is not the end from Down in the Groove in 19. 88. Osmond says, this was the first Dylan song I remember liking. My father's a big Dylan fan and he had bought this on cassette when it was released, at which time I was four years old. Me and my younger sister started to like the song when I was probably between five and seven. We used to find the cassette, fast forward to this song, listen to it, then quickly rewind it and listen to it again. Usually use the stereo in the living room, but if that was occupied, we borrowed my dad's Walkman and listened to it through the headphones. Those are great yesteryear memories for me. Uh, in 1988, I wasn't four years old. Unfortunately, I was 16. But hey, the song is originally an outtake from Infidels. It has a hopeful message about an afterlife in the midst of the troubles of life. And then I found Nick Cave covered it in 1966. Only song on the album Dylan self-produced with co-producing by Mark Knopfler, Great Dire Straits front man. Let's check this one out. Death is not the end. This was a heavy song. Starts out with instrumentals, harmonica, almost a minute in before the lyrics start, and then he bookends it, finishes it off with a nice little instrumental harmonica section. But you know what the what the title says, Death is not the end. Bob's telling you, he describes all these situations, you know, and and uh, Verse one, when you're sad and when you're lonely and you haven't got a friend, just remember that death is not the end and all that you felt sacred falls down and does not mend. So if you were searching for earthly riches, don't worry about it because just remember that death is not the end, not the end, not the end. Just remember that death is not the end. That's how he finishes every verse. Standing at the crossroads, cannot comprehend. Are your dreams have vanished and you don't know what's up to Ben? Storm clouds gather around you, heavy rains descend. I think a lot of people are going through that now and went through it, you know, in 2020. And then the bridge, he gets a little more emotional, a little more upbeat. Oh, the tree of life is growing where the spirit never dies and the bright light of salvation shines in dark and empty skies. So this is 1988, far past his Christian trilogy, but it seems to me in this, he's still holding on to those Christian uh, beliefs to some extent at least. When the city's on fire, the last verse, with the burning flesh of men, just remember that death is not the end and you search in vain to find just one law-abiding citizen and there he finishes with just remember that death is not the end, not the end. Really enjoyed that one. I think as a Christian, it really made me probably enjoy it more than if you're not a, a Christian, but still a great message. Now we're gonna move on to number two. From the Saved album in 1980, What Can I Do For You? Osmond says, in this song, Dylan thanks Jesus for what Jesus has done for him and asks if he can do anything in return. The most notable feature of the song is the fantastic harmonica solo, maybe Dylan's best ever performance on the harmonica. Wow, Osmond, that is high praise. Let's check it out. Wow, What Can I Do For You? That one was a super powerful one as well. Obviously, Dylan's pushing into his Christianity as I, as I talked about at the beginning. Uh, writing this to Jesus. And he starts out with the chorus, which he doesn't do often in his songs. You've given everything to me. What can I do for you? You've given me eyes to see. What can I do for you? All kinds of biblical illusions in here. Pull me out of bondage. You made me renewed inside. Filled up a hunger that had always been denied. Opened up a door no man can shut. And you opened it up so wide. And you've chosen me to be among the few because we get the whole for many are called, but few are chosen. What can I do for you? You've laid down your life for me. What can I do for you? You've explained every mystery. What can I do for you? And he just goes on and just thanks Jesus for everything he's done. It's kind of ironic because in Christianity, Jesus really doesn't call you or ask you to do anything. You don't have to do anything for your salvation. Now, you know, you should spread the word and tell people about Jesus. So in an essence, uh, Bob is already doing what Jesus called him to do because he's, he's getting the word of Jesus out there through his Christian trilogy and some things that he talked about. So he already answered his own question in the song. I just kind of found that ironic uh, when you look at it kind of in that context. Well, here we go. We're number one. 
Brownsville Girl, you see it below from the album Knocked Out Loaded in 1986. Osmond says an epic song from one of his worst albums in the 80s. I hope you enjoy all the references to Texas because we live in Texas. As it tells us a real story about a road trip across Texas and also have, has many references to the film The Gunfighter starring Gregory Peck. Dylan did like his allusions to movies, didn't he? And in my notes, I found it's notable for its length. It's over 11 minutes, as you see below there, and for being co-written by playwright Sam Shepard. The song is an overdub version of a December 1984 outtake from the Empire Burlesque Sessions entitled New Danville Girl. While as an album, Knocked Out Loaded was poorly received upon release, this song is considered one of Dylan's best pieces by some critics, so it sounds like Osmond chose wisely, not that I doubted it. 11 minutes, boys and girls. Buckle up for number one, Brownsville Girl. Wow, Brownsville Girl, definitely the right choice for number one. The word epic song, or the words epic song, are, are overused many times in hyperbole, but this was an epic song. Sam Shepard's take on this, remember he wrote some of this with Dylan, it has to do with a guy standing on line and waiting to see an old Gregory Peck movie that he can't quite remember, only pieces of it. And then this whole memory thing happens, unfolding before his very eyes. He starts speaking internally to a woman he'd been hanging out with, recalling their meetings and reliving the whole journey they'd gone on. And then it returns to the guy who's still standing on line in the rain. Wow. Okay, I guess I'll just start at the beginning, right? That's the right place to start. 17 Verses and that uh, what Sam Shepard said is right. He's, he starts out, he's waiting in line, talking about Gregory Peck in this movie, and first two verses about that. And then he he comes into remembering this relationship with the Brownsville girl. And Brownsville's a town on the in South Texas, almost near the border. And he just starts talking about that. And in verse five, he's kind of talking about their journeys. And they went on up to San Antonio. We slept near the Alamo. Your skin was so tender and soft. Way down in Mexico, you went out to find a doctor and you never came back. I would have gone after you, but I didn't feel like letting my head get blown off. Probably a good choice, Bob. So now where he's, it kind of jumps around because then we're going to go back to Amarillo and all this. But he, verse six, well, we're driving this car and the sun is coming up over the Rockies. Now I know she ain't you, so he's got somebody else, but she's here and she's got that dark rhythm in her soul. But I'm too over the edge and I ain't in the mood anymore to remember the times when I was only your man. And she don't want to remind me. She knows this car will go out of control. So a tough subject for Bob. Don't, don't bring it up to this man. Then it gets to that hook, which is so pleasing to the ear. Brownsville girl with your Brownsville curls, teeth like pearls, shining like the moon. And, and repeat the Brownsville girl. Show me all around the world. Brownsville girl, you are my honey love. A lot of people think this was taken from Dylan's hero, Woody Guthrie. He had a song called Danville Girl. And the original uh, title of this song, remember, was New Danville Girl. Because he has a Guthrie has a line in there uh, who wore about the girl who wore that Danville curl, so probably a pretty good assumption it was inspired by that. Then they head across the panhandle towards Amarillo. I've been there many times. Ruby was in the backyard hanging close. She had the red hair tied back. They were looking for Henry Porter. She comes in and says how bad her life kind of is. She wants to take off. Ask them how far they're going. I think Ruby jumps in with them. Verse 10, something about that movie that I just can't get out of my head, but I can't remember why I was in it or what part I was supposed to play. Uh, so pretty cool there. And then the hook again, which had nice horns in there, just all this great stuff. And then just kind of going on, then we go to Corpus Christi. He gets in some trouble. She puts on this great performance testifying for him. And it ends out where it kind of started. There was a movie I'd seen one time. I think I sat through it twice. Don't remember who I was or where I was bound. All I remember about it was it starred Gregory Peck. He wore a gun and he sh was shot in the back. Seems like a long time ago, long before the stars were torn down. And then the awesome hook to end it, the perfect way to end this song. What a fantastic track. And now we're going to get to my favorite songs. I liked a lot of these. Osmond did a fantastic job. Brownsville Girl is number one for me. I'll give an honorable mention to the previous song, What Can I Do For You? I don't know that I mentioned at the end of it. I was just so taken in by the, the harmonica solos. I don't know that I've ever heard anybody that emotional. You can feel the emotion of Dylan on their harmonica. So that's got to get it an honorable mention. I'll go with Mr. Bojangles as my second pick for my three favorites. Not just because I was familiar with the song, because it just fits Dylan so perfectly. I know he didn't write it, as I mentioned but it just seems like something he should have written. 
And I'm gonna go with Death Is Not The End from Down In The Groove in 1988. So once again, Osmond, appreciate you. Just a fantastic list, a fun one. Like I said, I love Dylan. When I did my top 50 albums of all time, three of the top eight were Mr. Dylan. So not gonna hide my love there, but I didn't know any of these songs besides Mr. Bojangles and I didn't know his version of it. So great choices, guys. So once again, Thank you for joining me. Let me know what other Dylan kind of lost songs or hidden gems that I should check out. Remember, Osmond didn't choose anything from the bootleg series. He wanted them to be for proper albums, but you surely can, can recommend some bootleg series to me down below. Once again, everybody, thanks for joining me, and I will see you next time.